your, for your final yet? Yeah. All right. Make sure when you get it that we uh, have a chance to go over it as much as possible. We're still in Chapter 12? Yep. And if I remember right, we've finished 12.14. Is that correct? Well, I think we're on 12.14. Unless you're on like number sixty-eight. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I don't remember doing this. Okay, here let's. All right. Solve each equation. Notice this is not one unit circle, but actually two unit circles. A negative one and a positive one. So we're going to need to come up with a bunch of answers. What's the first step here on A? I divide by 4. So I get sine squared of x equals 1 fourth. Next step? I'll take the square root of both sides. So what's the next line? Um, sine of x equals a... Uh, Square root of 1 divided by square root of 4. Which is? Um, 1 over 2. Okay. One what half. you forgot is the plus or minus. Always remember that when you are solving any kind of equation by taking the square root of both sides, begin your answer with the words plus or minus 100% of the time. Okay, now tell me in the unit circle where that occurs. Uh, pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. That's for positive 1 half. How about the negative 1 half? Um, 7 pi over 6 and um, 11 pi over 6. Okay, now that covers that part right there, but we also need the negative angles. What do you suppose those answers are? Um, the negative of all those. Yeah, exactly. So it's really plus or minus, plus or minus plus or minus. Notice that minus 11 pi over 6 is the same as plus pi over 6. So you really have eight answers to this very simple looking equation. Well, we only have eight answers because they gave us a domain that was kind of expanded. Typically, the domain they give you is 0 to 2 pi. And occasionally they will give you a domain that is negative infinity to positive infinity. And you have to put your answers in terms of k or n. Like uh, pi over 6 plus n times 2 pi. Are you familiar with answers like that? You ever, yeah. seen, you ever seen an answer like that? Uh, yeah. Okay. They may not use the letter N, frequently the letter K, but what this letter means is that these are integers from negative infinity to positive infinity. In other words, the answer would be every combination of this where K is equal to an integer. And that's the kind of answer you would get if they did not restrict the domain. All right. B. First step. I'll divide by three. Second step. Uh, what's square root of three. So what's this line say? 
Uh, tangent of x equals um, 1 over root 3. What'd you forget? It's a rationalize. No, I don't care about rationalization, to be uh, honest. By, but plus or minus. Uh -huh. Which gives you four quadrants in the unit circle that will satisfy this condition and four quadrants in the negative unit circle. So again, because of this plus or minus, we're going to have eight answers. What are they? What's x equal to? Um. If you can figure out the first quadrant angle, then you'll have all of them figured out. Where is the tangent of x equal 1 over root 3? 90. No, positive. What positive angle? Looking at my triangle, what positive angle is the tangent of that angle 1 over root 3? Uh, 60. 30. Tangents opposite over adjacent. So it's 30 degrees, or pi over 6. Now, as all we have, we know that every single quadrant is going to have an angle that's either plus or minus 1 over root 3, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the next one? 5 pi over 6. And what's the next one? 7 pi over 6. And what's the next one? 11 pi over 6. And all of those are going to be plus or minus because they're going to apply to these positive angles and also these negative angles. And I am now between minus 2 pi and 2 pi with all eight of these angles. Now, let's just talk about if this was not stated. Let's say they said the domain for x was all real numbers. Well, notice that this is a kind of a difficult series to write. Uh, forget for the moment that it's even plus or minus. Let's take that away. Let's just assume that those are the first four quadrants, but we have to give all answers. Well, how do you write this in a series? Well, how about this? x equals pi over 6, and you frequently have to do this. It's pi over 6 plus, use k or n? Uh, n. n pi gives you those two terms, gives you this term and gives you that term, and will give you the next term, which is going to be 13 pi over 6. So this gives you every other term, and I need a second 5 pi over 6 plus n pi. This combination between those two gives you all of the answers, including plus or minus, because n can be plus or minus. n doesn't have to be positive integers only. n can be negative. So n can go to negative infinity to plus infinity. The only thing about n is that it has to be integers, not fractions. So when n is 1, I get 7 pi over 6. When n is 2, I get 13 pi over 6. Notice that it tends to skip and go every other one, and then you need a new series for the second one, because that also skips and goes every other one. So if I'm trying to describe this series on the domain of all real numbers, I have to do it with two expressions. I can't do it with a single expression. Sometimes you can, 
In other words, there are trig functions that have answers that uh, you can put an answer like pi over 6 plus n pi, and that covers all the answers. But this isn't one of them. It depends on the series. And what you basically have to do is write out the series. 1, 5, 7, 11, 13. Well, how do you define that series? It's 1 plus 6 or 5 plus 6. All right. I don't want to spend too much time on that because that was not one of the problems. But um, all right. When you have an equation, a trig equation, notice here the domain is from 0 to 2 pi. That's far more typical. But when you have a trig equation like this, it's very difficult to solve if it's two different trig functions. Unless it's something like this. I can solve that because it's equal to 0. What, what can I do to solve that? Think factor. Uh, factor out of sign. Okay. In other words, the greatest common factor leaving this, right? And now, if that is a true statement, and it is, what has to be true? What must sine of x be equal to? Zero. Where does that occur? in this domain? Um, at pi and uh, 2 pi. Notice the domain goes from 0 to 2 pi without including 2 pi. So the answer is actually 0 and pi, not pi and 2 pi. 2 pi is not in the domain. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what else has to be true? Um, cosine x equals one half. Where does that occur in this domain? Well, I'm at uh, pi over uh, three. And what quadrant? One. Four? Oh, and four, yeah. Um. So what is it? It's a pi over three short of two pi is what it is. Uh, five pi over three. Yeah, and that's the way I think about it, is I know that it's that fourth quadrant angle whose reference angle is pi over three, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's pi over three short of a full two pi, which is five pi over three. So our answers to this are 0, pi, pi over 3, and 5 pi over 3. Four different answers. Trick skills are improving some. I can see it, Nicholas. Yeah. All right. What do we have to use to solve this triangle? What law? Um, sine. Notice that to use the law of sines, you must have a relationship between an angle and its opposite side. Do we have that here? Yeah. Oh, um. we really don't. If we had one of these other angles, then we would know that angle and we know the opposite side. So we would have that relationship. But x is not knowing that side. That's an unknown. So we can't use the law of sines to start this problem, which means we've got to use what law? Uh, cosine. Okay. Tell me how, what is x equal to? 
using the law of cosines. Um, Let me make it easier. What's x squared equal to? Uh, 6 squared plus 4 squared uh, minus 2 times 6 times 4. Um, uh, cos or times the law, cosine. That's the law of cosines. Of x. Not x, but the angle that's opposite x. Um, 130 so. degrees. Notice that everything on the right side of the equation is a number. So x is the square root of that. Thirty six and sixteen is fifty two minus forty eight. What's the cosine of a hundred and thirty degrees? Um. Thirty six and sixteen. Point three six. Okay, now we got x equals the square root of 52 plus, what's that decimal that you just gave me, times 48? Uh, negative 17.63. I turned it positive because I got two negatives here. with me? Yeah. Okay, so it's the square root of 69.63. What's that number? Um. Eight. 8.34. 8.34? Yeah. Now, does this picture make sense? Yeah. And what do I mean by that? That, um, that the longest the side is opposite the biggest angle. That's what I meant by that. Okay. And we're actually done. The problem was not solve the triangle. The problem was solve for x. So we did that. Okay, but it's always nice to take a look at it and make sure that it makes sense. Had we come up with an answer of 5, we didn't know it couldn't be right. Because 130 degrees is definitely the largest angle in the triangle, so the side opposite has to be the longest side. And the shortest angle has to be opposite the shortest side. So I know this is the shortest angle in that triangle. Now, if I did have to solve the triangle, what would be the next thing I would do? In other words, once mm -hmm. I've solved for x, now what can I use to finish solving the triangle? No sign. The law of sines, always. And the reason is, is that now I have that key relationship where I can say that the sine of 130 divided by 8.34 is going to be the sine of theta divided by 4. There's only one variable in that right there. So we can solve for theta. Once we solve for theta, we can solve for this angle by just subtracting the other two from 180. So the thing to really remember is if you cannot use the law of sines, then the only alternative is the law of cosines, unless it's a right triangle. Right triangle, solving right triangles is totally different. You don't ever need the law of sines or the law of cosines. Because all you need for right triangles are trig functions, right? But when they tell you to solve a triangle that's not a right triangle, they're always going to give you three pieces of information precisely. Never more, never less. And 
if you can see that you cannot solve this using the law of sines because I do not have that key relationship, well, what that tells you is the only other thing you got to use is the law of cosines. Now, it turns out the law of cosines is only used in two situations. Triangles that are side, angle, side, like this one, side, angle, side, or side, side, side. If I had a triangle 6, 7, 8, notice I do not have an angle and its opposite side. So I cannot use the law of sines. Now, having said that, the two situations where you use the law of cosines to begin, second step is always the law of sines. So you actually use the law of sines in every situation. It's just you don't begin the problem with the law of sines. You can't use the law of signs until you establish that relationship. What's the general equation here? A being the amount that it's going to be in the future. Let's write the general equation, not the specific yet. We'll fill it in and then we'll be able to answer their problem. But you need to know the general. That's the secret to all math, is learn the general equations and then they become all pretty easy. Um, so, um, starting price, or starting value, times, uh, the multiplier. Now, is one plus the rate of increase, all to the t power. In other words, it's an exponential equation. It's not an algebraic equation. It's exponential. And what they want us to solve for is R. Okay. Well, they've given us, there's one, two, three, four variables in that general equation. So if they give me three of them, I can always solve for the fourth one. Well, they've given me three of them. The final is 2195. The beginning is 1595. That's one plus R. And they said that it happens in four years. So now I can solve it. I'm looking even at an algebraic equation. I'm not looking at an exponential equation anymore. My variable's on the algebra line. It's not in the exponent. So tell me the steps I would take to solve this. You're pretty good at algebra. You should be able to do this. What's the first step? I'm going to divide each side by 15.95. What's the next step? I uh, take the fourth root of both sides. That's going to leave 1 plus R on the right. So R ends up being that minus 1. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, in actuality, when I took the fourth root of both sides, I got a plus or minus. And for the same reason, when you take the square root of both sides, you always get a plus or minus. If you take any even root of both sides of an equation, your answer must begin with plus or minus. It's just that in this case, the minus numbers don't make any sense. We know R has to be positive, so we discard that minus. And that happens a lot. A lot of times you get a, you know, when you're doing geometry problems, you know that all dimensions are positive. 
So just because you're solving an algebra equation and you get a plus or minus doesn't mean the minus means anything. It just means that was part of the solution. You then have to determine whether it makes any sense in this problem. And in this problem, it does not make any sense. So the answer is the fourth root of this number minus 1. And do you happen to have that answer? We'll see if it makes uh, sense. 0.08. Now, does that answer make sense for an R? Yeah. Yeah, it's 8%. Perfect. If you had come up with 0.8, I would have said something's wrong. It is not going up 80% per year. And if you'd have come up with 0 .008, I would have said something's wrong. Because it's certainly going up more than 1% a year. So that makes perfect sense. It's also a reasonable rate. We're 90% sure we got the right answer. Do you think we could skip to the 76? Sure. You don't have any problems with these anyway, do you? No. Okay. Curious as to E and F, but no, we'll skip to 76 for sure. Have you looked at all of these already? I mean, do you know what these problems are? No. Okay, that's fine. I'm glad. This looks familiar. We did this last week, or last session we did this. You had me start on 1276. Really? Uh-huh. What's the secant of B? Um... Um, it's, um, B over C, or C over B. Nope. First of all, do it this way. I noticed you had some problems with this the last time we did it. You won't have any problems at all as long as you do it this way. It's 1 over cosine of B. Now tell me what the cosine of B is. B or A over C. So it's 1 over A over C, which is the reciprocal C over A. Okay. In other words, is all you have to do is figure out what the cosine is and flip it. That's always what these reciprocals are. You don't even have to go through that step. Just figure out what the cosine is, A over C, and flip it. It's C over A. What's the tangent of A? Um, A over B. What's the cotangent of A? Uh, B over A. What's the cosecant of A? Um, C over A. Good. Yeah, uh, I'll bet we've seen the next one too. Um, I don't remember how far we got, but I definitely recognize that last problem. Um, I can't remember if we've done this or not, but let's do it again. This is pretty typical. This is one of the few trig equations that you can solve without converting everything to the same trig function. In other words, I'm going to solve this without converting anything. Whereas a lot of times, if I've got like tangent and cosine and the same trig function, then it's hard to solve it unless I convert that tangent to some type of cosine. But in this, this is what kind of problem what do I have to do to solve this? Um... Simplify. Um, factor, 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 factor. Always think factor. When you're solving trig equations, always think factor. 
because most trig equations, that's how they're solved, is by factoring. Okay, what's the greatest common factor? Uh, cosine. The rest of it? Um, 2 sine x equals 0. Plus 1. Oh. In other words, I got to factor cosine x out from that term, and it doesn't leave nothing. It leaves 1. Okay. In fact, we've done this problem. No, we haven't done quite this problem. We did something similar. So cosine x equals? 0. Which makes x equal? Um. Here's where you need to get better, Nicholas, is solving these instantly. You don't want to solve these in your calculator. You know how you want to solve those? You want to solve those by knowing what the cosine curve looks like. Well, there's two places where it's zero. There and there. What are those two places? 90 degrees and 270. And what else? Because they didn't limit the domain here. We're going to have to use that series that I was, the end series for this problem. And the best way to use that series is to write another two or three terms. So what's the next term? And the way to do this is just to add 360 to this and then add 360 to that. What are the next two numbers? Uh, 450 and uh, 630. And then one more term, and I'll explain why one more term is helpful. Add 360 to the 450. Um, 810. These always go weird. In other words, they go like this. Okay. So let's come up with a series for just uh, not yet. Let's solve the rest of it. Let's use that because maybe we can come up with a bunch of numbers that we can define with one series. We don't, won't need two. If I had to define this series only, I would need two series. You with me? Just like I did when I showed it to you. But mm -hmm. let's solve 2 sine x plus 1 equals 0. And who knows what we're going to get. So sine x equals minus one half. Where does that happen? Um, 5 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6. It's negative one half. So it's 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. 5 pi over 6 is in the second quadrant. Sine is positive in the second quadrant. Okay. Now, we have a little bit of a problem here. We got one thing in terms of degrees and the other thing in terms of radians. So let's put the second one either in degrees or the first one in radians. I'd say let's put the first one in radians. That okay. makes the most sense. So instead um, of 90, what is it? Pi over 2. Instead of 270, and what is that? 3 pi over 2. Instead of 450, what is that? 5 pi over 2. Instead of 630, what is that? 7 pi over 2. Ah, we actually have a series here where we could define with one series. Notice. If I was defining just that series, it would be pi over 2 plus n pi. And that would take care of everything, the entire series. Okay. Now, let's give the first three terms of the second part of the answer. 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6 are correct. What's the next answer? 19 pi over 6. The next answer. 
Um, 23 pi over 6. We really need one more just to see that we're not going to be able to define this with one series. What's the next thing? 35 pi over 6. Adding 12, I think it's 31. Right? Nah, something's wrong here. Let's see. That's 12 pi over 6 separated. That's 12 pi over 6 separated. And that's 12 pi over 6 separated. So there's nothing wrong. We got it right. No. Um, now the question is, you know, let's erase that because we don't need it. Notice this bottom series cannot be defined with one term. There's a difference of 4 there. There's a difference of 8 there. A difference of 4 there. A difference of 8 there. So the bottom one, what if we put them all together? Let's see. If we put them all together, let's just see if that helps. We get 3 pi over 6. 7 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6. You see what I'm doing? Yeah. No. 11 pi over 6. Fifteen pi over six. Nineteen pi over six. Again, that's separated by four. That's separated by two. That's separated by two. That's separated by four. Again, four. I don't think I can come up with a single series that describes this series. So let's not try. In other words, we don't need to because we've got, I can certainly describe all of these answers with two different, three different series minimum. Because I can describe the first series as what? Pi over 2 plus uh, 2 pi. Not 2 pi. Or pi. Plus n pi. Notice that these are all separated by exactly pi. 2 pi, two pi over 2, which is pi. Okay? So this series describes that set of answers all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now how about the second series? I'm going to need two descriptions for it. What's the first one? Um, 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi times m. And what's the second one? 11 pi over 6 plus oh, 2 pi times m. Now, it's possible that I overlook something and that when I combine these two series like I tried, I could come up with a slightly condensed version of the answers. In other words, it seemed to me like when we were looking at the, when I did it that way, they were either separated by 4 or 2. And they went in pairs. They were separated by 4, 4, 2, 2, 4, 4, 2, 2. I should be able to come up with two equations that describe that series. I'm not going to waste time doing it because it would just be an exercise in uh, the ability to put a, series, a sequence of numbers into a series. And that's not really the purpose of this problem. So I don't really want to spend time doing it, although I suspect we could. In other words, our answers were those three. You know what? I'm kind of curious. <laughs> they don't they don't help much. 
All right. I get it. That's what I did. That still doesn't help figuring out how you structure the series to relate to those answers. I said to you, what is f of 3? What would you do? Um, uh, square 3, multiply by 2, subtract 2. In other words, you'd plug in whatever's in the parentheses for x. Mm -hmm. I said to you, what is f of x plus 1? What would it be? Um, x would equal x plus 1. Hold on. No. I'm going to write the function. Whenever I run into x, I'm going to plug in x plus 1. So it would be that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the game. Whatever is in the parentheses, no matter how complicated or whether it's a number or whether it's a function, you plug it in for x. That's the game. What f of g of x means is this. f of g of x. Well, what's g of x? That means this. What's g of x? x plus 1. So that's what I have to do. So I'm going to plug in x plus 1. I wasn't even looking at g g of x, when I said that, must have subconsciously looked at it. That's what f of g of x is. Now, I can expand that and simplify it a little bit, but I don't know that I should. That happens to be in perfect vertex format for a parabola. That is a parabola, and so I'll leave it in vertex format. I don't think I'd want to expand that out. You'll know and a lot more about the parabola if you leave it in this format. You know what A is. That's the vertical stretch factor. You know it's horizontally shifted one unit left, and it's shifted down by three units. Other than that, it's a parabola. That's what these composite functions, that's how you do it is you just write it like this, and then whatever the g of x function is, you substitute it, and then whatever is in the parentheses, you substitute it in the f function. You have to make sure you're dealing in the right function. give you a good way to memorize some indifference. First of all, I'll check and see if you know, know it already. You don't have it written in front of you, do you? Okay. Do you know what the difference of cubes is? No. Okay. Then let's go back to the difference of squares. What's the difference of squares equal? Difference of perfect squares. How do you factor it? A plus B, A minus B. You know what? For some reason, everybody remembers it like that, but there's a really good reason to remember it like this. They're the same answer. I understand the associative property holds, but there's a reason to put the minus one first. Here's what it is. When I do difference of cubes, 
The first term is a linear term with the same sign as what I'm looking at. That term is a quadratic term with the opposite sign. Same thing with the sum of cubes. The first term is a linear term with the same sign, plus and plus. The second term is a quadratic term with the opposite sign. Now, notice the pattern between those three answers. The first term is always a linear term with the same sign as that. That makes the second part easy. These, it's always a squared plus b squared. It's always a, b in the middle. And the only difference is the sign on the middle term for the second part. So, let me start at the beginning here. Factor A. Um, x squared. Um, x cubed plus 8y to the third. Notice what that is. That is the sum of perfect cubes, which means you can factor it further. Factor it. What's the first term got to be? x plus 8. Not 8. The cube, the cube root of 8. In other words, the linear term is always the cube root of that, which is x, plus the cube root of that, which is it's not 2, it's 2y. So that's the first term, is x plus 2y. Now the second term. This term was a squared plus b squared with a middle term of minus ab. So what is a squared? Um, x squared. What's the middle term? Um, minus 8x. No, it's ab. A is that term, B is that term. So it's just 2xy. And then the final term is B squared. What is that? 4y squared. That's how you factor that. That's the answer they're looking for. Factor it as completely as possible. Now, just a heads up. This will never factor nicely, ever. When you have used the sum of cubes to factor it, the quadratic term never factors. I mean, it factors with the quadratic formula, but that's all. Never factors on its own. Okay? And... Uh, clearly, if you didn't believe this, you can multiply these three terms back together again to get what we started with. But I don't think we need to do that. Let's go to the second one. Now, the second one, is this the sum or difference of perfect cubes? Should be one or the other, right? It's mm -hmm. on this page, and they said use the sum or difference of cubes to solve. So it should be. Tell me what A is, and tell me what B is. Um. Take the cube root of that to get A. A 2Y. 2Y cubed. Excuse me, 2Y squared. 
You see why 2y squared is the cube root of 8y to the 6th? Yeah. Okay, what's b? Oh, 5x. Now, we know that this thing, we're looking at the difference of perfect cubes. What's the general? Um, a minus b. Times? Um, a squared plus a times b plus b squared. Yeah. It's always a plus b squared, no matter what we're doing here. So now it's just plug in. So what's the answer? Um, 2y squared minus 5x times 4y to the fourth plus um. 10, oh, I did a second, x. Uh, plus 25, x to the second. Good. That's all there is to difference of cubes and sum of cubes. Now, the next one I'm kind of curious about because they say it's tricky. What could it be so tricky about it? Can't be any trickier than the previous one. Right? I mean, we've already figured out that A was 2Y to the 6th. So what's A here? Um, X squared. Actually, you know, we could make it X cubed. Right, let's look at uh, C. Notice that I can do C in one of two ways. I can treat it as the difference of perfect squares, or I can treat it as the difference of perfect cubes. What's the easier way to treat it? Not cubes. Exactly. So treat it as the difference of perfect squares. What do we have? Um, x squared. X cubed. Or minus y cubed. All right, that's the A minus B. What's the A plus B? Um, it's always the conjugate. You don't even have to do any work. Whatever you got for that term, this is the conjugate of it. And notice that's the difference of squares factor. I could have done it as difference of cubes. If you started at difference of two cubes, you will not be able to factor it completely. Think of it as the difference of two squares, then factor as the sum or difference of cubes. Okay, we're not done here. Let's finish this problem and we'll be done. Factor the thing on the left. I did start it as the difference of squares, which is a good thing. Had I started as the difference of cubes, I would have run into a roadblock. But now I can do it. What is this factor into? Um, x minus y times x squared plus x times y plus y squared. And what is this factor into? Um, x plus y times um, x squared minus x times y minus y squared. Very good. And there's your four factors, and I can't do anything further. And when they said that if I would have started with it as the difference of cubes, I wouldn't have been able to go any further. And I wouldn't have. I would not have been able to apply the factoring that I know. So some of these, this is a little tricky because it depends on whether you start it with the difference of squares or the difference of cubes. And I guess I'm always going to say, always start it, always do it the easiest way. And it was far easier to think of it as the difference of squares than it was the difference of cubes. So I'm always going to do it that way. But then after I'm done, I notice, ah, now I got a difference of cubes here and a sum of cubes here. So I can do stuff to both of these things now. 
Alright. Nicholas, I'm going to let you go. Sounds good. Okay. You're doing good. You're doing better. You know most all of this stuff. Or at least understand it once I explain it pretty good. So, keep it up. It'll pay off. Your grade will go up, I guarantee it, if it hasn't already. Okay. Talk, talk to you later. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.